quisiera primero agradecer también la, la invitación de, de Baltasar Garzón. Sorry, I would like to thank uh, Baltasar and your invitation and the whole uh, foundation for this event. Uh, this is an honor for me to be here. I think this is a turning point, and this is the right time for it. It is just, it was about time, because that's when we start to see how our achievements for universal jurisdiction are being challenged. I would like to refer to my report, as you said, which was my wish. I've always wished to convey this idea of the evolution of the right to truth in the Latin American system, we saw how truth was evolving as a, as, a, as a value itself without ever weakening the need and obligation and the urgency to meet justice. This is a report from the Rapporteur's Office of uh, Freedom of Speech, and I've done it from a from a point of view of access to public information, especially in the case of victims of violations of human rights. And then, as always, the starting idea was that the state needs to guarantee the enforcement of human rights. It needs to protect those people who enforce and, and try to have their human rights enforced. At the same time, Whenever there is a violation of human rights, the state is, is to investigate them. In case of a violation, there also needs to be a criminal process against the culprits, and that's criminal law together with human rights law. That's the link. But something that has been forgotten, and that is that the state has the obligation to investigate and prosecute, but at the same time, there is the obligation to give information to victims, victims and their family members, and I extend on that in my report, and the society as a whole, they, have their, they are entitled to being informed about why the rights were violated, violated, who was the perpetrator, who was the insider, and what the final outcome was, and where these people, these culprits, are to be found in current times. If democracy is to be measured by respect or enforcement of human rights, whenever there is a violation of human rights, investigation becomes an essential factor of democracy. We've always seen, especially in case of uh, transitional justice, we thought that truth is the first step towards justice. That's, that's true. No justice can be achieved without true truth. But we've also seen how important truth it is, is in itself. In the struggle against uh, impunity, there was this update report where this is clearly explained. I think this is principle number four, where it says truth needs to lead to justice, but we also need to rethink the power that truth itself has to take down the wall of impunity. Truth itself is effective because those who were perpetrators or insiders of violations to human rights started with the idea that no one would ever find out, that they, it would fall into oblivion, into the past, and that no one would, no one was entitled to investigate because they would be risking their lives. And then, as time goes by, and time is a cure for everything, they thought no one would investigate or prosecute. And this is their premise, their false premise. However, all those pain actions that are not investigated, those are injuries that become deeper and deeper. They get infected, and they add pain to a society, as it has been said, and so it increases the social conflict and also prevents real reconciliation from happening. At a time where, well, and we've seen that in previous questions, previous questions uh, to Diego Garcia Science, and you wanted to know if there was a conflict between serving justice and achieving justice, a peace, sorry. Some people in my country wanted a conflict between truth and peace. They, want, they said that oblivion was better. And we had to remind them that there's no option. Uh, there can be no peace without justice. 
justice and truth cannot be interpreted as a threat against truth, actually. They are just requirements, prerequisites. Of course, there are ideas of uh, lawfulness for both parties, but amnesty law within the frame of human rights cannot impact on the rights that victims have to know the truth or have access to justice, both for victims and their families and the society as a whole in, in the end. Because when time goes by, it's not just about victims and families anymore. It is the right of a people to rewrite its own history, to recover its own historical memory, understanding then how they can design their new future. And there is a new report here, and it is only if a people has the right to assume its own past, it will be free to assume its own fate without Considering the past, we cannot have no we can have no future. We've been kept in ignorance. But the only way to guarantee non-repetition, the only way to guarantee that the the same mistakes are not repeated over and over again is to assume them. And that's why, in my report, I tell the difference between knowing the truth and acknowledging the truth. Because sometimes truth is known. We all know what happened. But it is very important for the state to officially acknowledge the truth. When I was presidential secretary for human rights uh, two terms ago, there were many reparation actions. I felt it was crazy because I had felt my, my I, I had lived my life fighting dictatorship and still I was in the state and I had to acknowledge violations from 20 years ago and then I realized how important it is for society how important it was for victims specifically and one of the m most touching examples moving examples was this woman who had been murdered and leader from Kashiga where the military sorry the military killed her husband and she wanted to, to have someone apologize to her, to her place. This was just crossing a couple of cliffs up a hill. And what she wanted, and the feeling that she had obtained reparation was based on having someone, I, I was the secretary there, and I walk up and down under the rain I got there with a full team, with a full task force, we got to her place, and there, her place, we apologized on behalf of the state. It seems negligible to most people, but for her, the world changed. It was her and her kids. And that's when she said, I start building in the state now. This is the lack of credibility in our indigenous people. So without the truth, without the state acknowledging the truth, and without achieving justice, then our state is not credible anymore. It's not trustworthy in order to lead the future of the people. And this is the most important message. As for access to, e to public information, of course, I have this uh, proposal, and that is that all states have archives, have archives, and if they don't have them, they need to find them. And if they were destroyed, the state, it's, it's to rebuild them again. Because most of the time, when you move from a dictatorship or an authoritarian, authoritarian government, the thing is that uh, archives are not kept tidy, they are gone, they are missing, we don't know where they are, who has, who has them. So it is very important for those archives, for those files to be found or to be rebuilt. In Argentina, I was there when they found the minutes from the junta, the military board, in the past, from the past. And so President Fernandez, Cristina Fernandez, and some other officials said, this is quite a change in mindset because it was an army official that found the archives. Any other time, well, he could have taken it from the basement, the third basement, and had those files destroyed, and no one would have noticed. Or he could have filed it away or hid it. But as someone representing this new Argentina, a military person in the new Argentina, he sent it to the Ministry of Defense, to the Department of Defense, and you can find a list of people disappeared there who were victims of crimes, of disappearance. 
And I think this is proof, this is proof of real transition in a country. I know there is uh, uh, room for improvement and many things to be conquered and achieved, but having someone who accepts and acknowledges truth in my own country, in the case of genocide in Guatemala that's been mentioned here, I, I think that for my country, for my victims, I, I, f I, I felt the honor to know that genocide was the first to uh, it was the first time that genocide was prosecuted in a domestic court ever. It would have been, it, and it was, a great achievement for Guatemala's justice. And this was made possible thanks to the fact that we had a general attorney who was not corrupted, who was very brave, and working together with a court team that trusted their own instincts, their own principles, and that stood by their principles against corruption and against other crimes and offenses that affect other people. And it, it well, there is this um, claim for the Supreme Court. And still, the media, the media have this article and there is a suspension of the final part of the, proce of the proceedings and so they go back to the court. But this, this was an attack on justice for us because it comes a time that once you've recently uh, stated that there was a genocide, once you got a sentence but which has been voided because of an article in the media and so the constitutional tribunal was on the, the influence of the media and so uh, for me this is a mistake, it's a mistake that we'll have to pay for and that's how we in Guatemala we vanish into a rhetorical discussion where we try to, we start remembering, remembering this armed conflict. And it is so very serious when the people lose it, their option to reparation and justice. But what we achieved, and this is a fact, since the hearings were public and were radio casted uh, all over the world, everyone heard the testimony, especially testimonies of, of women, women who were victims of genocide in Guatemala and this is part of our own of our own awareness in Guatemala and it is and it is a tragedy that we know the truth but that justice is not being served and i say so because this example can be useful for many countries and that is that no matter how painful it is how controversial it is how threatening it may, may seem for a peacekeeping process defining the truth finding the truth it is just a prerequisite. It is just an, uh, something unsurmountable. Well, uh, I didn't come here to discuss the Spanish case because I'm not an expert, but still I get an idea. And finally, I would like to talk about the responsibility and liabilities of public officials to make it possible for people to have access to this information. In my country, all officials are in the duty to claim file a claim in case of a crime, and if they do not file a claim, then they'll be com committing another crime that it's a mission of denunciation. So I say there is this obligation for the official, not just for the state, where uh, citizens need to have unlimited access to public information and without limitations to, to national and domestic safety and security, because this is about human rights. And for example, when talking about armed forces or law enforcement, what we say is there is no limitation. But apart from the fact that the state needs to guarantee access to information, because it is public information, and it is part of our historical heritage, and this information that is not just useful for investigators and victims, as I said, but it's also helpful for historians and helps rebuild history, track down history. But there, there's also a personal obligation by public officials that whenever they find information having to do with violations of human rights, they have to report it. They have the obligation to report, to make it public, send it to victims or report it to legal systems. This is the case in Argentina with the archives from the military, military dictatorship that were discovered by an official who did what, what was right, sent it to the ministry, and the ministry made them public. And for me, it is important to measure the accountability, the liability of a public official 
according to how they react in, in these cases, because f concealing information, hiding away information from violations uh, 20 years ago, in my case, 50 years ago here in Spain. But this is an offense, this is an offense, and this is being accessory to the crime because it's concealing violations. So they're becoming accessory to the violations because they favor the prevalence of impunity thanks to silence. And this is a very important factor. And that's why I reiterate the significance of the individual liability of each public official. And finally, these public officials who are brave enough to report it, whistleblowers or claimants, they are the ones who report it. They should n never have any type of criminal liability when it is about revealing state affairs having to do with violations of human rights, no matter how much we've talked about confidentiality or privacy. If it's a violation of human rights, this privacy is not applicable. Confidentiality is not applicable. You cannot keep a violation like that muted, or we can not let anyone go unpunished for this. I think this is a very important principle. There can be no, no criminal liability in case of whistleblowers because of violations of the present or the past. If there are physical violations such as torture or interferences or privacy or tapping, etc., bugging of phones, all kinds of report denunciation is lawful and that's the way it has to be considered. That's my message for Spain and for the rest of the world. This is not just for Spain. Truth is important, per se, but truth accompanied by justice and reparation, these are the three pillars towards reconciliation. And without all these three pillars, we cannot achieve true reconciliation. And so there will always be damages that have not been repaired and pain in the society. Thank you very much. Their liabilities. Flan, Flan Larou. stolen kids. It is said that one of the main difficulties is having access to church archives, to church files, uh, which are private, not public. So what can be done? What kind of protection can they claim? So how can they have access to those documents? Sometimes it's essential to know the origin and destination of stolen kids. There are two different approaches here. The right to truth. And I think it is the state that needs to tackle this problem with, this, with the church. So this is a request from victims to states. And the state is the one that needs to request the church's uh, collaboration through cooperation through documents and then protection of childhood. All oh, this happened 50 years ago. It could happen again to, to kids now. And so the only safeguard is clarification of facts. If you do not clarify and explain the facts that happened 50 years ago, they could go unpunished in present time as well. So I think the convergence of these two factors needs to be preserved. But again, the release of, of the files or disclosing of files, uh, or at least of a specific document, that's the state throughout the prosecution and investigation. Uh, whenever they have a prosecuting task, uh, 